Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another horrible case. Before starting the story, I want to apologize for my bad English. I am not a native speaker, however I am trying my best for you guys. Thanks for your understanding. Life in an orphanage is not the best. You don't have your own corner, you don't have your own time, and if you can't fight back, you get beaten up by those who have been here for a long time. Amanda and Anna Marie McClure are a little luckier than the others. When there are two of you, the likelihood of fighting back increases. Besides, these juvenile aggressors only pick on loners. The sisters were comfortable alone, and they did not try to get acquainted with anyone. They hoped that their stay in this hell would not be long. Soon their mother would find out that their father had been imprisoned, which meant that the girls were sent to an orphanage from which they should be taken away as soon as possible. It is impossible not to find out that their father, Larry McClure, was sent to prison. It was talked about on TV and written in newspapers for a long time. Time passed. Days turned into weeks, weeks into months. It became clear that we could forget about returning home. One day the sisters rescued a newcomer, Meredith, from being bullied. The girl lived with her drug-addicted mother, was very thin, frightened, and flinched at any rustle. She came to the shelter after her mother died of an overdose, and Meredith herself was afraid to call the emergency services, so she lived with her body for a few days. One day a friend came to visit her mother, and upon finding her friend dead, called emergency services from a payphone so as not to be involved in any way. Meredith became a friend to the McClure sisters, the three of them becoming more fun and safer. Amanda and Anne Marie had never told anyone the reason they were here. Meredith had asked about it once, but Anne Marie had brushed it off and blurted out something about a policeman father who had tried to apprehend a dangerous criminal, but had been killed on the job. Amanda listened to the story with her eyes wide open, but her sister gave her a look that told her to stay out of it. Enraptured by their father's posthumous deed, Meredith told about the sisters' fate to the other students of the orphanage, and in an instant the sisters turned into real stars. They were respected, they were envied, because most of those who were here had parents who either died from illegal substances or went to prison. Eventually, all the children wanted to be friends with the sisters, and their reclusive life came to an end. Unfortunately, this beautiful life, albeit in an orphanage, quickly came to an end. Unknown from where the information appeared that the father of Anne Marie and Amanda is not a dead policeman at all, but on the contrary, a living criminal serving time in prison for violent acts of a sexual nature towards a young girl. Then the fate of the sisters turned into a real hell. However, after a while, they were lucky. Fortunately, two different families decided to adopt the girls almost simultaneously, and they got the opportunity to start a new life. But however, already separately, the connection between them broke and was lost. There are no details about the sisters' life in foster homes, Amanda and Anna Marie could remain in this story only children of the rapist, but their adult life flowed into the most high-profile case of the state of Virginia. Amanda is known to be married to 38-year-old John McGuire. They met when she was already 29 years old. Her adoptive parents even began to worry that Amanda would be a loner for the rest of her life, and the lack of biological family, including the betrayal of her mother, had a negative impact on her psyche. The foster parents breathed a sigh of relief only when Amanda admitted to them that she had a young man with whom they were going to get married. It was the second wedding for John, and he also had two sons from his first marriage. Anne Marie had never been able to build her family. One could be happy for Amanda. She really could have a strong and loving family. John was an incredibly positive guy. What could be said against it if even with his ex-wife they had a warm and friendly relationship? After a while, the sister's father, Larry McClure, was released on parole. Settling still in the same Virginia in a mobile home, he made no small effort to find his daughters. The first place he went was to Amanda's foster parents, Gwenham and Alex. Larry went straight to their house, said hello, introduced himself, said he wanted to see his daughter and asked for her contacts, address, and phone number. Outwardly, he looked very bad, even frightening, deep wrinkles all over his face, huge bags under his eyes, and besides, as it seemed to them, he was not sober. No, he didn't smell of alcohol, and he didn't stagger from side to side on shaky legs, but in general his behavior was not adequate. 
Glenn refused Larry's request, but promised that they would be sure to tell Amanda that her biological father was looking for her. Larry had been really freaked out when he'd heard the phrase biological father, but he'd thanked him and left. Glenn had indeed kept his word. He had told Amanda that her father was free and looking for her. In the back of Amanda's mind, there was a demon who denied everything and advised to send her father to hell and an angel who advised to give her father, though a criminal, another chance. The angel won, though it was unclear who was better to listen to. First, Amanda called her father. He said he was very happy to hear from her, asked how she was doing. She told him that she was doing well, married and feeling happy. Larry was happy for his daughter and suggested that she come over for a joint dinner with her husband. Amanda didn't realize if she should live to see her father, but it was as if he knew just what to push. Come on, forget the old grudges. I have lived all these years with only one thought, to see you and Anne-Marie. Anna, unlike you, must have missed me after all. You've already seen her? Amanda wondered. Of course I have. We went on a nature trip with her and had a wonderful time, like a real family, like father and daughter. It was like those years of separation never happened. She also asked a lot about you. If Amanda didn't know how to deal with her father, she wanted to see her sister, who had been separated from her in the orphanage almost 20 years ago, and so she agreed. In the case file, there is no description of their first meeting, but two facts are known. Larry lied about Anne Marie. At that time, she lived in North Carolina, which is 186 miles from Virginia, and Larry had never seen or spoken to her. And so, father and daughter met. Their meetings led to Larry getting Amanda and John hooked on illegal substances that he brewed himself in his camper. Larry literally used the daughter and son-in-law before meeting the father. The financial situation of the couple was stable, but Larry pulled money from them for the production of illegal substances, and when Amanda and John lost their jobs because of their addiction, Larry persuaded John to register because drug addicts received help from the state in the amount of $180, which were still not enough to buy substances and ingredients. That's when Anna Marie appears in the story, and Larry uses her in the same way. He gets her hooked on substances and pulls money out of her. Amanda and John find themselves at an impasse. They have no jobs. Because of huge debts, they lose their house, and the only way to stay afloat is to move into Larry's camper. John's folks at this point still had no idea he called his parents. His mother was seriously ill at the time. John informed them that he and Amanda were going on a trip together. That was the last time John's parents heard their son alive. In fact, no trip was planned. Amanda and John moved in with Larry, where they engaged in a small circle of illicit substance use and alcohol consumption. The whole tragedy occurred on Valentine's Day. John, who rarely recovered from the effects of illegal substances, was still madly in love with Amanda and decided to prepare a surprise for her, a festive evening in the family circle. He bought meat and alcohol, cooked a fancy dinner, at which in addition to his wife, of course, were Larry and Anne Marie. Under the prolonged influence of the drugs, a terrible madness occurred in the family. Amanda and Larry became much closer than father and daughter. Unfortunately, John couldn't see it coming. Yes, you all thought right. Father and daughter considered themselves a couple. Therefore, John was now redundant. During the meal, John spoke very many warm words to Amanda, and Larry was insanely nervous about it, and the tension grew. Eventually, Larry interrupted his son-in-law's speech and asked him if he could be completely honest with his wife. The man replied in agreement. Then Larry proposed a game. John's legs were tied, and he was asked to answer honestly all the questions that related to his past life. Yes, at first, the questions were really harmless. Childhood, school, university, and all that. But at some point, Larry, under the influence of drugs, began to accuse John that he was an undercover FBI agent. And when John denied it, they started beating him up. It ended when John, begging for mercy and covering himself with his children, tried to untie his legs and had a bottle of wine smashed over his head. Yes, it was the same wine he'd bought for the family dinner. Larry, Amanda, and Anne-Marie tortured John for two days and used illegal substances in parallel. Finally, when they had had enough, 
Amanda pulled a black bag over her husband's head and squeezed it around his neck until he stopped breathing. John was buried in the backyard, after which the crazy family celebrated the engagement of Larry and Amanda, father and daughter, and naturally it had to be celebrated with a new batch of psychotropic substances and alcohol. On the third day, their psyche went haywire. They began to see John's ghost, police sirens, and the ground in which they buried John seemed to them unearthed, as if John was able to get out of there, escape and report everything to the police. It sounds wild and crazy, but the crazy father and daughters decided to back up. They dug up John's body, checked his pulse and even his pupil's reaction to flashlight light, even though the body, for all its biological signs, was already in the decomposition stage, but that didn't seem enough to them. To prevent John from coming back to life and escaping, they cut his body into pieces with a wood axe and drove an aspen stake into each piece of his body. The remains were reburied in different places and covered with lime to speed up the decomposition process. Three weeks later, Larry and Amanda were married. Larry changed his name so that no one would know they were related. The new family decided to start a new life. To do this, they moved to Kentucky and agreed to stop using illegal substances once and for all. In the rented house, to hide all suspicion from themselves, they even hung a U.S. flag over the door to the house, just like their neighbors did. By this time, John's ex-wife and parents began to worry that he wasn't making contact. And in 2019, John's mother even filed a police report about his disappearance. As for Larry, he failed to notify the police that he had moved from one state to another, and that was against the terms of his probation, which is why he went back behind bars. In prison... Larry's psyche finally failed. It's hard to expect anything good when you've been using illegal substances for a long time, mixing them with alcohol, and then, at the snap of your fingers, you find yourself in a place where you can't get them. Withdrawal syndrome works. Increased nervousness, lack of boundaries between reality and fantasy. It's pretty clear if you marry your own daughter. Larry was pretty sure that the parole violation was just an excuse to dig up the backyard and find the remains of John's body. He urgently needed to contact Amanda or Anna Marie and tell them to have his daughters dig up the body parts and rebury them somewhere far from home. All prisoner calls are always tapped, so the information had to be conveyed in a veiled manner. Larry even prepared a speech and thought of everything in detail, but the problem was that he was denied calls. Finally, he couldn't stand it any longer, called the policeman on duty, and told him he had something to confess. Larry's logic was that if he confessed to the murder before he was charged, he could avoid at least the death penalty. And if he blamed it on his daughters, yeah, that would be even better. The cop didn't even believe Larry at first. What murder? What body parts buried in the backyard? What was this lunatic's idea? Why would this junkie dig his own grave? But by law, the man's word had to be verified. At first, the check wanted to organize only formally. Yes, there was a statement, yes, the place was checked. No, nothing was found. But then it turned out that John is really considered missing, and just in case, to the place of Larry's residence, sent a police detachment. First on the ground, they found traces of the lime that Larry had mentioned, and then, absolutely all the words of the criminal were confirmed. The McClure sisters were apprehended immediately. Amanda and Anna Marie were in shock, and simply could not believe that their father and for someone else and husband, could confess to such a brutal murder. They were even more shocked when they learned that Larry tried to make himself an innocent sheep, and in his testimony indicated that it was his daughters killed John, and he was only an unwitting participant in the crime. Then each of the family began to save their own skin, and to convince the police that it was just him in this terrible story was an accident. It was especially hard for John's relatives in this situation. Since his body, in fact, there was no body, and there were only remains, these remains had to be taken from the criminalists, transported to his parents and buried in a closed coffin. It has been mentioned many times that John was a very nice guy, so despite all the difficulties, his parents were able to bury him. Some of his friends helped with money, some with transportation, some with funeral arrangements. John was buried in a Lutheran church on October 25, 2019. On February 15th, the day after Valentine's Day, 
Someone in the McClure family posted a Facebook post on John's behalf that he was leaving on a trip where he would not be able to be in touch for a long time and asked his friends not to worry about his long absence. This indicated that the crazy family knew that they were going to kill the poor guy soon, so they misled everyone so that the family wouldn't start sounding the alarm. Despite such a brutal crime, for the duration of the trial, Larry and Amanda had six months added to their sentence for the marriage of a daughter and father. As such, marriages are criminalized in the state. The trial began. Larry was given the floor. I have felt remorse for my own children for most of my life. Yes, when they were very young, I committed a serious crime that put them in an orphanage. Their birth mother abandoned them, and I was the only one who had a heartache for my little ones. I am extremely grateful to the people who adopted my babies. I will not hide. I even attended churches and prayed for their adoptive parents when I got out. I crazily wanted to make up for all the years I had missed. That's probably why I acted the way I did. I mean, I could have walked away from the crime if I'd convinced Amanda not to do it. But I confess, I didn't. Mr. Judge and jury will probably not understand me, and I share their point of view. But the thing is, they weren't in my shoes. John was a fine young man. I feel sorry for him. If I could, I would turn things around. But no one can raise the dead. And I couldn't say no to Amanda, my favorite and youngest daughter. But she didn't care about John. All she wanted was to be able to withdraw government money from John's account. Have you ever been willing to kill a man for $180? No? Then if you don't understand me as a father, you should understand what kind of person she is. She's a monster, not a person. Me, Amanda, and Marie, we are overly addicted to illegal drugs, so we deserve to be punished. I want to address the jury. No matter what sentence you choose for me, I'm sober about my health and say that I can't live more than 10 years. I'm very sorry for this situation and I apologize to all of John's loved ones. Again, he was a great guy. The trial went on for a very long time as the defendants flip-flopped back and forth on the decision to kill John. Amanda, who could not tolerate such a long trial, even made a deal with the investigators where she was promised to be charged with involuntary manslaughter. At the next trial, Larry gave a very different speech. When it all started, the four of us bought the ingredients to make illegal substances and went back to my trailer where I started making them. Amanda came up to me and said she wanted to get back at John. The fact is that John, under the influence of the drugs, raped Anna Marie and she got pregnant. And as for me, I had to earn the trust of my daughters after all these years apart. I couldn't refuse, you know. I blame myself for that. I think every day that I should hang myself. But why should it be me if this crime is their fault? After Larry's speech, John's family got the floor. His mother sobbed nonstop, so much so that she couldn't say a word. Even if I can ever forgive the McClure family, I will never be able to forget what happened. Also, know that I wish I could live to see the day when one of them dies before me. Then John's children were given the floor, who literally cursed the killers and said they would never forgive them. The judge handed down the final verdict, which sentenced Larry McClure to life in prison without parole. When the punishment for Amanda was announced, her adoptive parents were very sorry that they did confess to their daughter that she was wanted by her father. They had brought her up with freedom of choice all her life, but they did not know that this freedom could have such an impact on her future fate. Amanda, in turn, during the announcement of the verdict, said that all this is the fault of her father, who could not survive the feeling of jealousy. Amanda's poor parents asked the judge to consider that if it were not for the negative influence of her father, their adopted daughter would never have gone to such a brutal crime. However, prosecutors viewed the murder as a conspiracy so that Amanda and Larry could be together as a couple. The first hearing was dedicated to Amanda, and she was sentenced to 40 years. But the judge noted that she would probably be behind bars for only 20 years. When the sentence was read to Anne Marie... She tried her best to prove that she was against John's murder, but she was forced to go to the end by her father and sister. And she was a witness at the wedding of Larry and Amanda only because she was afraid for her future life. In the end, Anne Marie was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Thanks for watching this crazy story, guys. Subscribe to the channel. Jack was with you. See you again.